When I say Monstera dubia, most of you will think of this shingling plant on your left. But did you know that Monstera dubia can grow into this monster when it matures? I grew this plant in just two years from an unrooted two-leaf cutting. So if you want to learn more about Monstera dubia, the journey the plant and I have been through over the last two years and everything that I learned about this plant, then stay tuned. Hello everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Well, welcome back if you're a regular viewer. If you're new over here, my name is Jan, also known as Sydney Plant Guy and I love growing aeroids indoors. I mainly grow climbing aeroids like this Monstera dubia over here. In this plant spotlight series, I'm going to show you one plant and I'll show you the journey the plant and I have been through over the last two years and then I'll talk to you about anything that I learned about this plant over that period. So I got this plant as a two leaf cutting in September 2020 and I'll pop a photo up on screen over here. The cutting was unrooted and when I got it in the post, basically what I did is I took the cutting and I popped it on a takeaway container just full of moss. I popped that in a prop box so the environment is nice and humid and I put it in a bright spot. Within just a couple of weeks, the cutting started growing roots into the container full of moss. And as soon as it had a couple of roots, I then transferred it onto a moss pole in October 2020. As you can see by that photo, it looks ridiculous at that stage, right? That tiny little cutting on that huge pole, but I know Monstera dubia is a pretty fast and vivid grower. So there's no point in giving it a small pole, knowing that it's probably going to outgrow that pole within just half a year. And I was pretty much spot on. This plant is the fastest grower out of all of my plants that I've got in my collection. So highly, highly recommend to aim high straight away. There's no point in giving it a smaller pole. You're just gonna end up extending it all the time. Next photo in January 2021, you can really see that the plant has taken to the pole. It's climbing up the pole and it's climbing with very small internodal spacing. So when juvenile, Monstera dubia is a shingling plant, so that's why I decided to put it on a flat pole. It's not really flat, it's actually kind of just like D-shaped or half moon shaped. So it's basically like the same way I make my normal moss poles, just I may I flattened out one side. And that is to give the juvenile form of this plant a flat surface to actually shingle on. If I would make it round, all of the leaves would kind of wrap around the moss pole and I don't necessarily like the look of that. Yeah, I wanted to, to give me this beautiful shingling uh, growth pattern. Come here. Because it's growing with very small internodal spacing and each leaf is increasing in size, I know that I'm giving this plant the right care. Predominantly, I'm giving it enough light. If you don't give your plant enough light, you will see very leggy growth. So you have a lot of space in between uh, leaves. Um, and the leaf size won't really increase. So if you have a dubia that's just climbing up a pole and it's just like this one long runner with like tiny little leaves here and there, you are like 99% certain you're just not giving it enough light. This plant um, is probably one of the most light hungry, one, uh, light hungry ones out of all of my plants. What's up, baby? What's up? You're throwing your crazy five minutes. All right, in March 2021, it reached the top of its first 90 centimeter pole already. I'm so, that was quick, lucky. I set it up on a large pole straight away and then I just extended it, putting another 90 centimeter pole on top. Again, I made that one D-shaped so that the poles um, kind of stack on top of each other. Even though when mature the plant stops shingling, because I just keep extending the existing poles, I'm kind of stuck with that D-shaped pole, um, which is totally fine. Um, I, I don't mind it, but it actually takes up much more moss than uh, the normal round moss poles. And technically, from an um, integrity perspective, uh, a cylinder shape or round shape is, is a little bit stronger, structurally more sound than this uh, D-shaped pole, technically. So... This is really the only plant that I'm using this different pole with. Um, all my other poles are just round and six, centi se six centimeters in diameter. I really only used this um, D-shaped or half moon shaped pole for the dubia because it's a shingling plant when juvenile. By May 2021, you can see that the plant has started to grow onto its extension and it, still the leaf size is consistently increasing. So I'm happy. I know I'm doing the right thing and we're heading in the right direction. Keep in mind, my goal is really I wanted it to fenestrate as quickly as possible. And I think when I first got it, somebody on the internet said to me, it's going to take at least two years for it to fenestrate. So I kind of accepted that challenge and I'm a really ambitious person. Like I was like, you know what? Let's show them how fast I can get this to fenestrate. 
and it only took me 11 months to get it to fenestrate. It gave me its first fenestration in July 2021. And I am honestly like the proudest plant parent in that photo over here, despite the fact that I'm in desperate need for a haircut. But I'm pretty sure that was lockdown times back in the days. Now, yes, it gave me its very first fenestration, but it also reached the top of its extension already. Right? So it was time for its first chop and extend. If you're not familiar with my chop and extend method, basically I take the top part of the pole, I pot it back up and then I re-extend the top part. So I want to continue working with the top because the top is the part that is maturing, right? If I would now cut the top off and I would keep working with the bottom part, then I kind of lost all my progress in maturity. So I'm gonna take the top part I'm purely relying on the um, roots within the moss pole to make this happen. So it is really essential for the plant to have heavily rooted into the moss pole. And I put in a video over here, you can see that this plant is rooting very, very well into that moss pole. Right? So um, there's plenty of roots within the moss pole so that when I cut it and then I pot it up, um, the roots will just expand from the moss pole into the pot and re-establish a root system and it will continue to mature almost as if nothing happened, give or take. So in August 2021, I did my chop and extend and then you can see in this photo that I, you can see in this photo, I took the top part and I re-extended it back to 180 centimeters. Now, of course, every time you do chop, there is a little bit of shock involved and the plant can revert and go back to smaller leaves. But because I'm giving it the best chances due to the moss pole and that large root system contained within the moss pole, at that time when chopping it, I hardly noticed any decrease in leaf size. But also I kind of chopped it just as we went into spring. So there was probably really, really good timing to give it a chop. Um, you know, it then re-established itself and all of that beautiful uh, spring sun and that spring uh, humidity and everything, you know, made it thrive even more. So by October 2021, you can see that the plant has now taken to its extension and keeps climbing up that moss pole and it keeps fenestrating as well. So it wasn't really too bothered by that chop and extend just a couple of months ago. And it just keeps going from here. So in November 2021, it's giving me continuously bigger leaves with more fenestrations. Hi, baby. By December 2021, it reached the top of its extension again. And it's continuously increasing in leaf size and it's continuously giving me larger fenestrations. And yeah. So in December 2021, it was time for its second chop and extend. So same process. I take the top, I put it back up and I re-extend it. Now, a lot of people ask me, what the hell do I do with the bottom part of that pole? Well, you can either chop it into single node cuttings and propagate them. You can sell them or you can swap them. I do a combination of all three. It really depends on the species, how much room I've got. Sometimes I do actually grow both of them. Um, so for example, when I did the first chop and extend, I actually chopped, them into, chopped it into single node cuttings and I put one of the juvenile leaves, uh, this one down here, or like le more or less juvenile, uh, I potted that on another pole because while I, really, while I really wanted this plant to mature and give me these beautiful fenestrations, that's really my goal because I don't know, there's something, I love setting myself a goal and seeing how fast I can grow something to maturity. I actually really appreciate the look of the juvenile form. So I wanted to grow both. So, um, you know, I do a combination of all of them, really completely up to you what you want to do with that bottom part. That bottom part has a huge root system, right? It's already potted up. The whole moss pole is full of roots and it's got a lot of leaves and I just chopped its growth point off, right? So it's going to have a lot of energy and nowhere to go with it. So it's going to shoot, reshoot, probably in a couple of spots actually. So far from my experience, more likely that the bottom part is actually gonna reshoot in multiple spots, giving you a really nice lush bottom part, um, ultimately. So it's like a really, really great way, not just to continue maturing your plant and keeping them to a manageable size, it's also just a really great way to multiply your plants if that's what you're after. Now, I re-extended it and then the same thing, it's just repeat, right? So the plant keeps climbing up that moss pole and keep in mind, I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, so December to March is like prime summer. So this plant absolutely loves light and we had a really humid summer. So by March 2022, it almost reached the top of its extension again 
and I had to give it another chop and extend in May 2022. So at this stage, there's only like five to six months between chop and extend. So it's climbing 90 centimeters within half a year. So definitely don't give it a small pole. This plant, when it starts kicking in and when it starts being happy, it's gonna grow really, really fast. Now, one thing before I do these chop and extends, I pop in a photo over here. I actually chop the stem on the pole first, the day before I do the chop and extend. And then on the day I do the chop and extend, I actually then just cut the actual pole in itself and I try and rescue as many roots as we can, but as I can. I've done the chop and extend on video a few times, so just check out my moss pole playlist and uh, you'll find the tutorial if you're interested in this method in a little bit more detail. And then since its last chop and extend in May 2022, it has grown from here up. Now, that last chop and extend, that's really the first time I noticed a significant drop in leaf size, right? So you can see that these leaves over here, they were all before the chop and extend. And then so this leaf is the first one after the chop and extend. Now, it's continuing to fenestrate. It kept all the fenestration, but the leaf size just got a little bit smaller. And I reckon it's mainly because I just chopped it going into winter. Plus, I actually moved it further back. So this plant is normally situated right here where my variegated monstera is just for the sake of this video today. So it's normally located right here. It used to be in the spot where the Cebu Blue is, this one over here. So I swapped them around because I really wanted to see the Cebu Blue mature a little bit more. So the Dubia is now a little bit further removed from the window, meaning it gets less access to light. Plus, because it was winter, it was just darker and there's less light. It's just outside the growing season or the optimal growing season anyway. So I reckon that's why it actually went through a bit of a decrease. Um, of course, the chop and extend in itself and the stress of all of that would contribute to that as well. You're so cute today. Obviously the chop and extend and the shock that comes with it would have contributed to the decrease in leaf size as well. But given that this is already the third time I've done the chop and extend and two of them were, or one of them was leading into spring, one was leading into middle of summer and then one was leading into winter. The one leading into winter definitely gave me the largest decrease in leaf size. Now, let's talk about that decrease in leaf size a little bit more. I get asked a lot when I do the chopping extents or when I do any sort of propagation if the plant is going to revert back to juvenile. Uh, you guys know, know I love growing my plants to maturity. So preventing the plant from reverting back to juvenile is kind of exactly what I'm trying to achieve. Now, I can't speak from a scientific perspective, I can only speak from my experience, but it makes total sense if you just think about it. A plant is not going to revert to juvenile just because you cut it. It really depends on the size of the cutting you take, so how many leaves does the cutting have, because each leaf is able to contribute to photosynthesis, aka produce energy for plant growth. And what's the root system like? If you take a very small cutting with no root system, well, the plant is going to need to establish the root system first and then it's going to grow. And of course, that new growth is going to be tiny. If you take a large cutting, so a large, like an already mature leaf with a thick stem, you know, and you take that unrooted, yes, the plant would still have to create a root system first, but once it does, it will grow back slightly more mature than if you have a really tiny cutting, right? Like there is a correlation between the size of the cutting, the size of the, um, the stem, the thickness of the stem and how large your growth is going to be. But if you take an unrooted cutting, of course the plant will always revert back to more juvenile leaves because it currently like <laughs> it doesn't have a root system to actually sustain the plant. It's not sustainable for the plant to throw out a huge leaf if it has no root system to actually provide that leaf with sufficient water and nutrients. If you, however, take a cutting with a large root system uh, attached to it, then the plant has everything that it needs. It has enough leaves to actually produce photosynthesis. It has enough of a root system to provide the plant with water and nutrients. So there might not be any shock. Even the opposite, what I've noticed as well, when I take a top cutting and I let's throw the top cutting out, let's don't worry about the top cutting, let's worry about the base. The base has a huge root system and the base has lots of leaves. We just clipped the, the growth off, right? That might actually, after the cut, instead of reverting back to juvenile, give you larger leaves than ever. So I've experienced that with my micans, for example. I cut it and then when it grows back, it actually grows big back 
bigger than ever. I've experienced the same with my Milano Chrysum. But ultimately, it's not necessarily, oh, you take a cut and it reverts back to juvenile. It's really about how many leaves and what's the root system and how mature is your cutting in the first place. Those are like parameters that you really need to consider. But also it's nature. It's not always predictable. It really depends on the species. Not every species like is being propagated and so on. So I hope that gave you a little bit of background. But if we apply those principles onto my chop and extend method that I'm using, when I take that top cutting, there's lots of leaves on it and the, every single leaf has a root system within the pole already. Meaning that when I now pot it up, these leaves can contribute to photosynthesis. The plant has absolutely no issues providing these leaves with water and nutrients because they're already rooted. So there is very, very minimal shock, meaning that this plant can pretty much continue maturing as if nothing happened, if the conditions don't change. Of course, if you then also decrease the light intensity, um, you know, decrease, let's say, the watering or, the, or you, you do stop fertilizing and so on, these are obviously also aspects that can contribute to uh, growing your plants to maturity. I suppose light is probably the most important out of all of them, but if we're keeping the conditions the same, we're keeping the light levels the same, and you just take a very well-rooted cutting that can live off of the roots that are in the moss pile, then you don't really need to worry about your plants reverting back to juvenile. That is the whole purpose of my moss poles. That's the whole idea behind me using moss poles because I'm limited with space. So I'm, I, I've got limited ceiling height and I'm relying for natural light coming in from windows. My windows don't reach all the way to the ceiling, meaning that really the light or like the top area where the light hits is really like limited to maybe this, right? Like this is like the perfect height. Like over here, it gets like the prime spot of light. If the plant grows any taller and towards the ceiling, it actually just gets access to less light, which means as the plant climbs up the pole, it gets access to less light, which is opposite of what happens in nature. In nature, these plants grow up a tree and as they climb up the tree and higher up into the canopy, they get access to more light. So your plant is not gonna revert, uh, is, your plant is not gonna continue to mature if you don't give it enough light. So really, Chopping and extending is the only way for me to keep maturing a plant within an indoor setting while keeping the plant at a manageable height. Plus, I love chopping them as well, right? At some, time, at some stage, plants can get a little bit overwhelmingly large, so sometimes chopping it and just cutting it in half is actually making it much more manageable and much more enjoyable for me. Like, I understand when people see these chop and extends on the internet, they're like, oh my God, I would die to own this plant. How come... How dare you cut it, right? And it's like, it's part of the thing. Like, if you want a plant to look the same forever, then you just got to get a fake plant, right? Plants grow, plants develop. Like, it's a living organism. You cannot get a plant and expect it to continue looking the same way. I personally probably think that, like, in July, when it first started fenestrating, but you still had the juvenile leaves at the bottom, I think that was actually the nicest looking time that this dubia had. I really like this transformation from juvenile to mature. But it's not going to stay like that forever, right? I either got to give it enough light so it continues to maturing or I give it less light and then it goes back to juvenile, which also would make it look weird, right? Plants is all about the growing and the journey. It's not necessarily just about hitting an end result. On that note as well, I know that a lot of people like oh my God, I want to grow this to look exactly like this. I could never, or this is going to take so long, right? Yes, of course, set yourself a goal, but really, really enjoy the journey. Throughout the two years of me growing this plant, I mean, every single photo, I am over the moon, really. Honestly, in every photo, as soon as my plant grows a new leaf and it's getting larger, the first fenestration, I'm over the moon. You know, I, I'm just really grateful and appreciative for what I got to grow and what I'd done rather than just focusing on, oh, but you know, somebody on the internet is growing a, a larger specimen and so on. There's always going to be somebody who's got a larger plant than you and a prettier plant and whatever. That's totally fine. You do you. It's your journey. It's your hobby. It's your plants, right? You can be proud of your plants and the growth that your plants give you at any stage. They don't need to all be impressive and mature. These are two years old. If you're just starting, and I, I have a few plants that are only just recently started on moss poles. And I'm still super, super happy with every single leaf that they give me. I'm like, anyway, I'm going way too deep. Sorry, I didn't mean to make this into like a therapy session. 
So, so this was kind of the journey of the plant and I've already spoken a lot about what I've learned about this plant throughout but let's really focus on the environmental conditions that I've been giving this plant over the last two years. It has moved around a little bit but really over the last probably year um, just purely based on size uh, it was living right here so where this uh, where this variegated uh, monstera is right now. So it gets light from a northeast facing window over here and by the time the plant is here it's about one meter away from, uh, from the window. Keep in mind I'm in the southern hemisphere so northeast exposure is the good one, right? So it's the equivalent to uh, east, southern east exposure in the northern hemisphere. So it gets quite a lot of light and as I said light is probably the most dominant factor you need to hit if you want your plant to mature, hence the decrease in leaf size uh, over winter as it has ac had access to less light. It's, it's not super fast about humidity, right? I do not control the humidity in this uh, room and also I keep my window open, it's really close to the window um, a lot, right? So if it's nice and humid outside, like at the moment I think it rained for like three days straight so we've got a decent 70% humidity at the moment so it's really really happy and I mean I can show you these roots at the back, I'll pop in a video over here, you can see the plant is really happy and it's really humid because it's starting to grow these really, really nice thick roots, um, which I really need to start doing something about. But that's going to be in another video that I'll film really shortly. So it's not too fast about humidity because it can easily drop to like 30-ish percent and, I, you know, it's fine. Temperature-wise, it definitely appreciates the summer months, so it appreciates the higher temperatures. In winter, it was still growing. The, uh, my, my apartment doesn't really drop below 20 degrees Celsius, but I think it definitely is going to um, appreciate the warmer temperatures um, as we go into spring and summer. Now, of course, it can probably survive much cooler temperatures than 20 degrees Celsius as well, but I mean, I just happen to have my apartment at 20 degrees, so I can't really talk about it. I love talking from experience. So I haven't made any experiences with this plant at any other temperatures. So I reckon, you know, keep it nice and warm and the plant will definitely give you its best potential or it will show its best potential. Of course, airflow is important. Airflow is important for all plants, especially where you have them on moss poles. We really want to make sure that we give our plants sufficient airflow so that the moss pole doesn't get moldy or that there's no fungal issues with any of the leaves. You know, um, airflow is really mimicking wind in, in nature and don't ever underestimate it. I have not had any issues with mold on any of my moss poles, but I get a lot of messages about it. So. I'm not quite sure how to help you guys because, as I said, I haven't experienced it myself, myself so I haven't really um, had to deal with it. The only thing I could think of is that because I give it plenty of airflow and always fresh air and, you know, the surface area of the moss pole is so large, it should actually be very hard for mold to form because it should dry out so quickly. Um, but yeah. Now these are kind of the conditions, so you know, nothing too special, pretty much the same as all the other plants that are in this room because duh, they're all in the same room. Now of course with all of my plants, it, they need food, especially if you want to grow them to maturity. So I use my regular GT Australia foliage focus weekly, weekly, so that's around about 5 milliliters per liter of water um, and I fertilize that at least once a week. If the plant requires watering more than once a week, then um, I, sometimes, I sometimes water without fertilizer. Sometimes I just have fertilizer in it as well. So I kind of just almost fertilize with every watering. Uh, and I've been doing that for two years now and I haven't seen any uh, negative effects of it. So I don't think um, you can really over fertilize, at least not with that fertilizer that I use. It's a mineral fertilizer and it's designed to be um, provided to the plant consistently, right? There's other fertilizers out there that, you know, just follow the instructions on the bottle, honestly. Like the fertilizer brand has produced it, so I'm sure they know best how to apply it. Um, but at least that's the one that I use. And as always, I'll link their Instagram in my description. Because the moss pole is a little bit thicker than my normal round poles, it actually dries out less quickly. And with a Monstera, I'm also not super concerned about the moss pole drying out a little bit, specifically if it just dries out on the surface. So usually I can get away with watering this once a week, but the top of the pole might dry out a little bit quicker. So every now and then uh, I might just have to pop an extra bottle on top of that pole throughout the week. Now it's way too big for me to actually carry it around and put it on the balcony or put it in the bathtub to give it a good watering. 
um, which is probably not ideal. I should probably do that more often so that I can also spray the leaves to get them nice and clean. Um, but because it's too large, it kind of just stays where it is and I just take a bottle and I pop the bottle upside down and because the pole is so thick, it usually takes two liters of water at least once a week. But again, the watering frequency isn't so important. It's really about when I water. I water before the moss pole fully dries out. That's because I don't want the roots within the moss pole to dry out, but also if you wait for the moss to dry out completely, the moss is gonna go hydrophobic, meaning all of the water is gonna just pearl off and gonna make a mess. I live in an apartment and I need my watering to be as clean as possible. So I water it before the moss pile fully dries out and then the moss can just really conveniently and cleanly soak up that water from that bottle as it needs it. And I pop in this video over here where you can really see how the plant soaks up that water and then the leaves even do like a little whip bouncy at the end, uh, you know, once they had a nice little drink. I have had zero pest issues with this plant so far, which is amazing, of course. Um, with Monsteras, if there are any pest issues, usually I would have thrips. Let me just look if the... No, all right, that was moss. If I have any pest issues with Monsteras, it's usually thrips, not necessarily spider mites. The spider mites are already super busy attacking my alocasias, so they leave the Monsteras alone. So if, if I have issues with them, it's usually thrips, but I haven't experienced it with my Dubia specifically, or Dubai, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Anyway, um, but if you do encounter any thrips, I use Comfidor Spray by Bayer. Okay, I think that's all I really learned about this plant. Now, let me just show you, because these roots have been going crazy, right? So this is the top part. Jesus. This is the top part that was only potted up in... Oh my God, I will never fit that back in with that root. Ooh. That was only the top part that was potted up in... When was it? Oh, May? I think in May, yeah. So that, that bottom part now was the top part of the pole in May. I potted it up and all of these roots have only formed since I cut it and repotted it. Obviously, when you cut it and the plant needs to re-establish a root system, it's really going to focus on building a strong, thick root system. I want to make this plant to continue to mature. I'm not happy with this growth that I've got on top. So I need to do a couple of things. First of all, I think I need to give it more light, so I might need to switch these plants around again. And second of all, I think I just need to give it a little bit more room for its root system. Um, you know, I love to um, underpot, underpot, I don't know if that's a word, but I like to keep my pots really small and keep the plants fairly root bound. I'm really just relying on the root system within the moss pulp, the moss pulp being a, a vertical extension of the pot. But I think given the size that this doobie has gotten and given the size of the roots, I mean, some of these roots are like the size of my fingers, like the thickness of my fingers. So I think I underestimated how crazy this plant can root into its support. So I need to give it a bigger pot and I also want to give it a larger support and I want to give it a support that is closed at the back. So all of these roots, rather than just sticking out, are kind of just funneled back into the pot. So. I'm going to need to get onto that someday, sometime very soon, and I will definitely take you along um, and show you how I do that. But all right, I think that's it for today. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope I, you kind of learned something new about Monstera Dubia and I hope I'm going to inspire you to grow some of your plants to maturity and see how fast and big they can grow in an indoor setting. If you like this video, please like, subscribe and comment and put on a notification bell so you don't miss out on any future videos that I'll upload, including the video of me reporting this monster over here. Thank you so much for watching and take care. Bye.